Well, it looks like fun and games until your kid gets called to the principal's office for slapping a teacher in the face, or worse, possibly under arrest. What's behind troubling TikTok trends that are taking off now that our kids are back in school? Plus, YouTube takes down any video it considers vaccine misinformation. Agree or disagree, does that open up anyone for online censorship, no matter their opinion? We'll get into that. Plus, dog on the hunt. The famed bounty hunter reportedly says he's close to catching fugitive Brian Laundrie. We're live in Florida with the details. Great to have you with us live in Chicago. The Donlin Report starts right now. Good evening. The Pulse of America tonight concerns about social media and our children. We know from internal documents now obtained by the Wall Street Journal and covered extensively here on this broadcast that Facebook is aware of the damage Instagram does to teenage girls. Facebook is also aware that it makes us angrier and divides us more. There's going to be a hearing on Capitol Hill tomorrow on what Facebook knew and what it did and did not do about it. We will cover that tomorrow. Meantime, tonight, our focus shifts to TikTok, which this week reached 1 billion users. That's billion with a B. In the U.S., nearly a third of them are aged 10 to 19. TikTok really took off during the pandemic lockdown. Teens doing viral dances, even getting their parents to join in. Since June of 2020, TikTok's user growth has nearly doubled to reach that 1 billion mark. But now, as students are back in school, a troubling trend. Monthly challenges, as they're called. The latest one is called Slap a Teacher, and it's exactly what you think it is. Here, a TikTok user demonstrates on a friend. Students are asked to calmly walk up to their teachers, slap them, then run away while recording the whole thing. Let me tell you something. How about we start a new challenge? How about be on time Tuesday? How about turn your work in on Wednesday? Like, these teachers are already out here hanging on by a thread. Let me tell you what, young ones, this is a challenge you need to set out. Yeah, listen to the teacher there. And there's a video of a recent challenge called Devious Licks, which involved students trashing bathrooms, stealing soap dispensers, or anything else around the school. There have even been arrests for this. Have a look at some of that. TikTok users have apparently set a complete list of challenges each month for the rest of the school year, each one seemingly worse than the last. In November, it's kiss your friend's girlfriend. December, flash the entire school. Nothing says Merry Christmas like a full moon, I guess. Vandalism, theft, assault, sexual deviance, public nudity. I hate to think what's coming in the spring. That's where we are. These are the unintended consequences of social media. For every fun viral video, there can be an equally disturbing trend. Certainly bad enough that grown-ups misbehave online, but now we see our children being encouraged to do so as well. And that's where we start tonight with TikTok Creator James O'Connor, nearly 350,000 followers. James, it's great to have you in studio with us. Uh, we know how powerful it is, 350,000 followers for you. Do you think it's powerful enough for this trend to actually happen starting on Friday where kids are slapping teachers? You know, of course I hope not. Yeah. So I, I think social media is really uh, treated, it's a magnifier. Right? So if you're a negative person, you'll probably put out negative stuff. Right? If you're a positive person, it, it's, a, it, it's a big blowhorn for more positivity, right? which is what I'm trying to be. Right. So I, I, the likelihood of a lot of kids acting on this, I think, are probably slim. Is one of your concerns with the power of this the, uh, the allure of the payoff for kids? In other words, this, they, they are going to get excited about maybe even you know, getting viral, whatever. 100%. Kids now want to be what? YouTube stars. I have a two and four year old that watch YouTube and that's what they want to do for a job. Mm -hmm. So it, it can absolutely be dangerous in the wrong hands. So we've seen this with the ice bucket challenge, the, the mannequin challenge where everyone freezes. Um, there have been lots of fun challenges that have been productive, but they seem now to be trending toward more destructive things. Sure. I, honestly, I think this is going to be a short-lived thing because there are spikes of negativity, of course, but uh, I'm an eternal optimist that mm -hmm. I think the power of good will take over. And funny videos, cat videos, those things are going to remain really popular where negative things like this, uh, they'll, they'll spike and they'll spike again, of course. Right. This is something that TikTok hasn't really had to deal with as much because it's been seen as more of a positive platform, a performance platform, if you will. But it reminded me today as we were talking about how glad we were, at least at my age, that we didn't have social media at my age, right? But for kids who are doing this right now, the fear is that they're not seeing 
seeing the damage that, that could possibly happen from what they're doing. Right. So to me, I teach kids and I want to try to help them find their purpose and be, be passionate about something. And I, I remind them that there's consequences to all your actions. So I right. want them to early find out something they love, whether it's a sport, martial arts, and if they're doing that, it's positive, but the consequences of maybe putting yourself on video, you're doing something right. bad, that's, that's gonna absolutely harm that. Do you think, and again, I'm, I'm aging myself here, but this might be the equivalent of, you know, kids are gonna pull pranks, right? Is this right. The, the same as, as egging a house as, or, or TPing a house, but this is potentially more destructive? Yeah, 100%, especially if you're slapping a teacher. Right. I, I agree. So again, I, I think that it's gonna be, statistically, it's more slim that the severe cases of them harming somebody. Right. I guess the other thing I wondered about with this, James, is, is that if you watch this, is it fair to blame TikTok? I mean, if, if, if a kid goes and does this, their parent, I'm guessing, would say, look, this isn't TikTok's fault, it's your fault. Yeah, so they don't blame TikTok for the good things. You can't blame them for the bad things, you know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. of course, it's gonna start at home in, in that whole cliche, but it, but it truly does. It's helping kids find their moral compass and empowering them to, to make that choice instead of these negative Choices right. So tell me a little bit more about what you're doing and how you're going against this trend and trying to channel kids and their yeah, energy I, into something positive. I mean, I teach from three years old all the way to adults. So a lot of times I'm going live with the kids and the kids that I'm in class with, I'm encouraging them. And I use social media as a positive thing. So yes, I show them, oh my gosh, you guys got 100,000 likes. Isn't that insane? Their self-worth is not based on the likes, but I try to encourage them like, hey, if you're gonna get, if you're gonna try harder, more effort, they're gonna give you more likes. People are gonna be drawn to that. And I try to put it, a, I'm gonna use social media in a positive way. It's around us, it's not going away. Right, indeed. James O'Connor, our uh, TikTok creator, inspiration specialist, you like to be called. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks for the time, James. Good to I see appreciate you. you. All right. Uh, let's move on, because we do have a little bit more on this. Uh, trashing a bathroom, that stays on social media. But YouTube now announcing that videos questioning vaccines are no longer welcome on the site. Among those being yanked, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., the nephew of former President John F. Kennedy. He's joined by Dr. Joseph Mercola, a physician and natural food advocate with hundreds of thousands of social media followers who published the book, The Truth About COVID-19. Here are some of his comments from last year. Anything that conflicts with that narrative is censored, eliminated, removed from the public discourse. Not to have Google or Facebook or Twitter decide that this is not something they should be exposed to. We're winning. You know, we, we, the information is getting out there despite the censorship. Jim Anderson, our friend and frequent guest, Social Flow CEO, joins us now. Jim, it's good to see you. I guess the first question is whether you agree or not, does this open the door to anyone being taken down off of YouTube if they don't agree with you? Well, I'm not sure if it opens the door for anyone, but it is an interesting step by YouTube. We've talked about this before, Joe. Right. The tech platforms are loath to be uh, the arbiters of truth. That's actually a Mark Zuckerberg quote that I shouldn't attribute to YouTube, but they've been very reluctant to try to do these kinds of things. And I think it's pretty notable that not only are they uh, taking a much more aggressive stance about vaccine misinformation, they're also going after the people who they say spread it and taking down accounts and, and effectively deplatforming people that they've judged to be guilty of that. Is this just the cost of doing business, Jim, with these platforms? I mean, essentially, you and I, again, have talked about this in the past. It's their playground and they make the rules. I think it is to some degree, but it's clear we've all seen and, and participated in the discussion that we expect more of big tech. When you become a one trillion or a two trillion dollar company, you know, the rules still apply to you, but in a very different way. And, and certainly what we've seen and Facebook and Instagram have gotten a lot of criticism about. You can't just say, hey, we put it out there. It's not really our responsibility. Right. And this is the flip side of this coin. I think Google and YouTube have said for a while, you know, we're trying to do our best. And they've taken a pretty significant step here by expanding the vaccine misinformation policy from just COVID to more broadly other vaccines and by you know, right. deplatforming people that they think are violating. Yeah, they're, they're going beyond COVID now and including things like uh, measles and the chicken pox. Um, do you think blocking it all though, Jim, is the right way to go? Why have they gotten away from putting the warning on it or saying this is disputed or something to that effect? I think they've concluded that the warnings are not enough. They're not effective enough. And they're criticized, you know, that, that's the nature of being a big tech platform. No matter what you do, you're gonna be criticized from one way or the other. And, and that's fine, that's what they signed up for. So mm -hmm. I think they believe the warnings are not enough. They wanna take a more aggressive step. And I'll give you an analogy. This feels to me very much like the seatbelt situation. Remember, you and I are both about the same age. Remember right. when seatbelts became mandatory, people thought that was a terrible infringement. Some people still think it's a terrible infringement on their rights. But it's clear if you wear seatbelts, you're going 
going to be less likely to die in a car crash. And so enforcing seatbelts has sort of become normal. I think what YouTube believes is that vaccines are effectively that same direction and they're very comfortable enforcing that policy. They'll receive criticism, no doubt about that. Sure. But I, they're clearly OK with that. I guess one of the reasons for that criticism would be, you know, the, the, is there better to have these debates out in open, Jim, than, than to bury it where uh, maybe it heads to a darker web or where people can still get it or will find it in other ways. Yeah, that's a very fair criticism. I think what YouTube would say is we're happy to have a debate. If you truly want to put up a video that's an academically oriented debate about where this came from. But I think what we've seen is people take advantage of that. They say, all I'm really trying to do is ask questions. But if you watch their videos, it's clear. No, they're not really trying to just ask mm -hmm. questions. They're taking a very strong advocacy position in a in a direction that YouTube believes is wrong and they believe it's misinformation and they believe it's something they don't want on their platform. Yeah. Why do you think it took so long for YouTube to come around on this? I know they did change on the misinformation part of it, but now it seems like they've gotten so much pressure to do something more about this, they've taken another step. Yeah, I think all of the big tech platforms are paying attention and you know, sort of just look at the uh, at the challenges that Facebook and Instagram were dealing with last week. You know, those are those things are not lost on YouTube. It's mm -hmm. a, it's an even bigger company. Google's an even bigger company than Facebook is. So they, they know that they're not going to be just sort of able to ride this one out and stay on the sidelines. I, I suspect they see the way the debate is going. They see the way the narrative is going. They have their own opinions and their own beliefs about mm -hmm. their platform. And they've decided now is just a good time to take an aggressive step in that direction. Yeah. And I know Facebook uh, will be before Congress tomorrow. We'll see what happens in that hearing as well. Jim Anderson, social media CEO. It's always great to have your insight. Thanks for the time. Thank you. Dog on the hunt. The famed bounty hunter reportedly says he's close to catching fugitive Brian Laundrie. We're live in Florida with details next. And PTSD is a major problem for our nation's veterans. Could psychedelics help? It's a controversial idea, but it's getting a lot of traction. We'll get into that. And don't forget, you can follow us on social media at The Donlin Report on Twitter. The search for Brian Laundrie continues for the 11th day since Northport, Florida, police began their manhunt at the Carlton Reserve. That was last week. But Dog the Bounty Hunter now says he believes Laundrie could be elsewhere in Florida. Joining me now, News Nation's Brian Enton. Brian, I know you were able to talk with Dog the other day. He's still based in Florida, though. He, does he think Laundrie's there? Yeah, Joe, I actually just got an update about five minutes ago from his team. They are over at the DeSoto campground right now. That's the campground we've been talking about for the last couple of days, about 75 miles from where we are. He says they're going island by island searching right now. He's got a team of private canine dogs out there trying to track Brian Laundrie's scent. Uh, and he says he'll be out there for most of the night. Uh, there's a, it's this basically state park with a number of small islands. He's on a boat, so it's going to take quite some time. But he's says he's got evidence that Brian Laundrie could be out there. Brian, what else are you hearing? Because there, there was a report that I saw today about a burner phone. I don't know if that was a, a phone that, that Brian Laundrie had or that his folks. What are you hearing on that? Yeah, it's been a busy uh, day, Joe. The burner phone issue also came up today. Uh, accusations that Brian Laundrie possibly had a burner phone. We spoke with the Laundrie family attorney. We actually were texting with him. And he did say that before Brian Laundrie went missing, the family did buy a new phone from an AT&T store here in Northport. But according to the, the lawyer, he says that Brian Laundrie left that phone at the house behind me when he went missing. And he says the family turned the phone over to the FBI. Brian, on a personal note, I know you've seen the reaction firsthand from the public following your Twitter feed, and I know you've also just recently been on a podcast for Megyn Kelly. I also know you as a reporter enough to know you're not the story and you're following the story, but I, I think it is an interesting perspective from your insight on how much people have really just been, I guess, obsessed by this story and following the development. It definitely feels like an obsession. There's almost a cult following to all of this, and I think people are just so interested in the, in the developments as they come out. And you've also got all of these at-home sleuths who continue to message me thousands of messages a day. They are going through every single Instagram post and looking for any small little clue. So you've got people all over the country uh, hoping to help solve this thing. Brian, I, I'll ask you something I asked Ashley last night, because initially there were a lot of people who thought, Brian Laundrie was dead. We're not hearing that as much now. I don't know whether all of these searches are underway and people aren't talking about it as much. Are you hearing that as much or not? 
Well, we just don't know. Two interesting things on that. Today we learned that uh, while Dog is over at the campground, the police and the FBI are back at the Carlton Reserve, but they are focused on the lakes now. They had boats over there today and they were looking in the lakes. Does that possibly mean that they believe he is dead? We don't know, but that was an interesting development. I've also been talking to former FBI agents over the last couple of days to get their insight. Every single one I talked to said, based on what they know about this case, they think Brian Laundrie is alive. Mm, interesting. All right, Brian Enton, good to see you again. Thanks for the update, as always. Gabby Petito's disappearance and murder have ignited a national interest, as we've mentioned, in other missing persons cases as well. Many, of course, that are not getting the same amount of attention as Gabby. Tonight on News Nation Prime, Marnie Hughes and her team are launching a new series called Missing in America. And Marnie's here now with a look at the first case they're featuring. Wouldn't it be amazing, Joe, if every missing persons case got as much attention right. as Gabby's is getting right now? And hers deserves the attention, but so do so many others. In fact, there are an estimated 89,000 active missing persons cases, Joe, in the U.S. right now. That's according to the FBI. Every one of these cases is someone who is loved, someone who is missed, who matters. And each one of these people deserves to have folks searching for them. Yes, Gabby's story captured the headlines, but it also served as a wake-up call that there are many other cases out there that we're not paying attention to. Men and women, boys and girls, people of color, indigenous people. This man right here is who we're featuring tonight. We're going to focus on the case of Daniel Robinson. He's 24 years old. He went missing in Arizona in the desert on June 23rd. He is a geologist. He left a nearby work site that morning, and he has not been seen since. His Jeep was found, crashed in a ravine about a month later with most of his belongings still inside. Joe, his keys were inside the car, his wallet, also his cell phone. Daniel's dad is an Army vet, and he is in Arizona tonight, and he says he will not leave until he gets answers about his son. Treat it like a mission. Um, I keep saying it. I'm a prof professional soldier. I have to do that. I have to do my job and find my son. He's my son. I'm his father, and it's my job. Right. Put yourself mm. in that parent's shoes. Oh, I mean, yeah. think you'd do anything to find them. So David has hired a private investigator to find Daniel. We're also in touch with the local police there in Buckeye, Arizona. They are looking into this case, and so far they say they have not found any evidence of foul play. So we've got our correspondent Nancy Liu there tonight. She's going to be talking to Daniel's dad about the latest in the case. How do you rule out foul play? I'm curious. I mean, they have the car there. They have all of his belongings. That, to me, would seem a little suspicious. Well, they say there's no evidence yet of foul play, that a crime was committed. So the police say, we're investigating it. We're going to follow all potential leads. But at this point, we don't have evidence a crime has been committed. They also said they spoke with Daniel's co-workers at that work site, and they said he had made some odd comments about wanting to take a break. So mm. at this point, they say, we don't have anything. The family doesn't believe that, though. They think there is evidence that something happened. This is not like Daniel to go missing. Well, it is so odd to have the car there mm -hmm. and not him. I mean, right. was, the, was the crash something that was survivable? Or right. What? So one thing that the family is really stuck on right now, the car was left, the airbags had been deployed, and the private investigator that the family has hired found that the airbags deployed 11 more miles were driven on that car oh, wow. before it eventually crashed. So they say that is very confusing and peculiar. The other thing is that Daniel's 24. What 24-year-old goes anywhere without their cell phone, right. their wallet, their keys, all of that still left in the car. So big questions tonight. We're going to be focusing on Daniel's case with Nancy Liu. I'll also be talking live with that investigator. It's a great idea for a series. And this, this started, it all started with Gabby's case. It right? started. I think it prompted it, but it really opened up our eyes that each right. one of these people matters. Their families want to know. And we want to follow up. We'll look forward to it tonight. Marty, great to see you. Thanks, Joe. Don't miss the special. It is uh, debuting tonight. Missing in America, 9 Eastern, 8 Central, on News Nation Prime with Marnie Hughes. General Milley faced his second day of grilling on Capitol Hill over the chaotic Afghanistan pullout. I'm going to speak with a congresswoman who isn't happy with some of his responses. That's ahead. We're back now with some breaking news. In the battle over pop star Britney Spears' conservatorship, she will no longer have her father managing her estate, something she has asked for. A Los Angeles judge has just suspended her father from the conservatorship that allowed him to control her life and her money. Meantime, a certified public accountant has been appointed as the temporary conservator 
of her estate. That happening just moments ago. A second day of testimony featuring the senior leaders who oversaw last month's withdrawal from Afghanistan. Now, today we saw partisan feuding as House Armed Services Committee Chairman Representative Adam Smith lectured President Biden's critics for having unfair expectations, while the panel's top Republican commander in chief delusional for suggesting the evacuation was anything but an unmitigated disaster. The president is the one in charge. This is ultimately what civilian control of the military means. And what I believe is, I believe certainly there were military commanders who said, no, nope, we should stick it out. We should keep the 2,500 there. I think they were wrong. And so did the president. This wasn't an extraordinary success. It was an extraordinary disaster. It will go down in history as one of the greatest failures of American leadership. We're here today to get answers on how the hell this happened. We are joined tonight by a representative from South Carolina, Nancy Mace. Congresswoman, it's good to have you back again. I want to play before we start a clip from General Milley from the hearing today talking about the war overall. We'll get your comments after. There's a whole series of decisions that take place over 20 years. Uh, I don't think that whenever you get some phenomena like a war that is lost, and it has been in the sense of we accomplished our strategic task of protecting America against Al Qaeda, but certainly the end state is a whole lot different than what we wanted. So whenever a phenomenon like that happens, there's an awful lot of causal factors, and we're going to have to figure that out. A lot of lessons learned here. So, Congresswoman, we lost the war. Do you agree? Well, I agree after 20 years and looking how quickly Afghanistan fell to the Taliban, we do have to ask ourselves that question. I think the majority of Americans would agree with this sentiment of General Milley uh, from that video. I, I think that uh, most of us, most of America wanted to get out of Afghanistan. It's the how we did it that has been so troubling for most of our country. Yeah, well, Axios is reporting, and this came out late as well, in a classified Senate briefing, Millie blamed the State Department for the botched evacuation and waited too long to order the operation out of Kabul. Uh, certainly more blunt than he was in his public testimony. No, that's right. And I have attended uh, two classified briefings in the House of Representatives, bipartisan briefings, and that information was not provided to us. In fact, one of my frustrations, I walked out of these briefings, was that we were not provided classified information that would help give us some insight on what really happened. And today, after hearings in the Senate and in the House over the last two days, I think there are more questions than answers because we're hearing one thing out of President Biden saying he wasn't told to keep troops in Afghanistan. And then we hear another from General Milley and other military commanders under oath that say that, say that he was told that. And so um, it's, it's troubling. Do you think there's a possibility that someone beyond the military leaders who obviously suggested that he keep uh, troops in there uh, on more of a diplomatic effort, though, and not military, that, that someone else beyond those military officials were uh, in the president's ear? Oh, I have no idea who's in the president's ear. None of us really do. And, and we still don't know how this decision was made. And, and there's no disagreement here. I wanted us out of Afghanistan. Most of the country did. Most of the members of Congress would agree with that. But when we, uh, we took out our military first, we gave up our Air Force base. We didn't uh, take out our, our citizens and our SIVs and our allies on the ground. They should have gone out first. We should have made an effort to destroy or remove the billions of dollars of equipment, and then at that point removed our military. But one of the one things about the timing of this that I have great concerns about is that we did this in the, in the prime fighting season, uh, terrorist fighting season for the Taliban, as opposed to a different time of year when, when, they're, not, when they're not in fighting season. And so um, these questions haven't been answered yet, and we have more to go. More investigations and more hearings should be held until we do have them, even if they have to be classified. Should we just accept, Congresswoman, that a president has his prerogative or hers to uh, make the final call? We were saying today it's sort of like telling your boss, well, I told the boss what I thought, and they did whatever they wanted anyway. Well, at the end of the day, I mean, the buck stops with President Biden, and he does take full responsibility for what happened in Afghanistan. But I can tell you, a lot of our military veterans, that even those that wanted out of Afghanistan and Americans all across the country, 
they're very disturbed by how we did it. Um, I attended a classified briefing last week with Republicans and Democrats. Our, answer, our questions were not answered in that briefing. We were not provided classified information. And it was about the vetting of Afghan nationals that are here today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is not okay not to, to obfuscate or not provide that information. So I'm encouraged by the hearings, and I hope that they continue until we get all of the answers on what actually happened and, and uh, who advised whom to do what, because it seems like there's a lot of blame game going around tonight. Right. You heard General Milley at the end of that comment say a lot of lessons were learned here. Given your military experience and background, what's number one? Well, I never served in active duty military. I did attend the Citadel, exactly. the Military College of South and Carolina. Your I have a lot of family. Yeah, my father was in the military for 28 years. Most of my family's active duty are retired veterans. Um, they were very, I, I will tell you, they, were, they, they wanted us out of Afghanistan, but they were disturbed by the process and how we did it. Um, by, by very quickly getting out of there with leaving citizens behind. And even today, we don't have a full accounting of the number of citizens we left behind. But we do have, at least in the NDAA, we do have provisions within the NDAA to get more of this information in holding what happened in Afghanistan mm -hmm. accountable. But I will tell you, most folks that I talk to who are active duty or retired, they're, they're very disturbed by how we did it. All right, Representative from South Carolina, Nancy Mace, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, there is a lot going on in Washington this week. An intra-party battle between progressive and moderate Democrats over a roughly $1 trillion infrastructure package. The split is so deep, President Biden had to cancel the trip to Chicago to stay and at least try to mend that divide. And the president could certainly use a win on infrastructure or elsewhere because it's one of his lead policy goals, especially with his overall approval rating at 45 percent compared to 49 percent disapproval. We would have asked the congresswoman about this, but this is all happening on the Democratic side. So we're going to bring in now Mark Fisher, the Washington Post senior editor. Uh, as we mentioned, Mark, there is a lot going on, and I think it's as much about the personalities as it is with the policy. So let's start with this infrastructure plan. It looks like there'll be a vote on it. On Thursday, there appeared to be a bipartisan deal, but now progressives are threatening to vote it down if the Senate doesn't pass the Democrat spending bill. So the question is, is this the squad's moment? Do you think they will push this? Well, it's, uh, they're certainly threatening to. I mean, the good news here is that we've finally achieved bipartisanship in Washington. It's a bipartisan addiction to brinksmanship, <laughs> uh, to these kind of last second uh, deals where uh, it looks like the government's going to shut down. We're going to uh, head into economic catastrophe if the debt ceiling isn't raised. Uh, but the fact is that many of these big deals get done on the eve of, if not right. on the day of a vote. And so tomorrow is really where the the rubber meets the road. Tomorrow we're going to get a vote on whether the government is going to have enough money to keep operating on Friday. Right. And uh, there are, as you say, there are these liberal Democrats who want to stop the infrastructure bill uh, and stop uh, in order to salvage the social spending bill, the big package sure. uh, that has run into trouble within the Democratic Party. Senator Bernie Sanders is urging the House to vote no, uh, progressives in particular. Uh, do the progressives and Democrats lose leverage on this bigger spending package you're talking about if they go ahead and approve the infrastructure plan separately? Well, that's their fear. It's not really clear that that's the case. And it should be noted that while Bernie Sanders may be urging uh, House liberals not to vote for this, he did vote for it. So uh, the, the Senate has already passed that infrastructure bill. Uh, and the question now is whether indeed uh, the, the liberals are so determined to get both packages that they'll hold the infrastructure package hostage in order to do that. And uh, certainly the president uh, mm -hmm. is making the impression upon many liberals that they've got to come along on this one. He was elected to be a centrist, to compromise, to bring people together. And uh, this is his chance to do that. If he doesn't how, do it, he's in trouble. Yeah, that's, I was just going to say, how important is it for him to get a win on this, Mark? Well, he needs to, at the very least, he needs to get the spending bill passed so that the government keeps operating on Friday. The infrastructure bill is his one shot at saying, look, I did get something done on a bipartisan basis because Republicans, some Republicans in the Senate mm -hmm. did come along on this vote. And uh, it's a trillion dollar package. It's something that would help people in all states. And so the idea that it would falter because the Democrats couldn't keep their own house in order mm -hmm. would not look good for Joe Biden. All eyes are on cinema 
and Manchin in the Senate. Republicans, we talked today about uh, how have had similar concerns with Collins and Murkowski and getting them in line in the past. But do you think Democrats ultimately get in line here? You're talking about brinksmanship. How do you think this ends? <laughs> If you look at history, uh, these deals tend to get done. Uh, they had tend to get done in a very messy way, very last minute. Uh, but this, uh, we're in uncharted water, waters here, and, and it's not entirely clear. Uh, we have a lot, number of progressives, the squad you mentioned, Bernie Sanders, uh, who are saying this is our one shot to get the big, bold initiative through that Joe Biden said was going to be the centerpiece, the heart mm -hmm. of his uh, administration. And so uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's going to come down to those final minutes. Yeah, a lot to watch in the days and weeks ahead, especially as we mentioned. Essentially, the credit card bill is coming due tomorrow night at midnight. We have until October 18th to pay it. I guess we'll see what happens. Mark Fisher, it's great to have you again tonight. Thanks for the insight. Thanks, Chuck. Don't do drugs. At least that's what your parents probably told you growing up. But what if some drugs, magic mushrooms, could help treat PTSD, depression, and other issues. We'll talk about that ahead. Plus, the growing list of companies firing workers over vaccine mandates. I'll speak with a CEO about those problems coming up. Back with more on the breaking news we're following. Britney Spears no longer will have her father managing her estate after a Los Angeles judge suspended him from the conservatorship. Let's go live now to California, where News Nation's Michael Schur joins us now with details. Hi, Michael. Hey, Joe. Uh, if it's Britney Spears, you know you're coming to me. Uh, today, uh, it was something out here. I mean, there were hundreds of her fans, they call themselves the Britney Army, asking to free Britney uh, here in Los Angeles. And what that translated to is exactly what you said. And it happened today. People weren't sure it was going to happen today. But he actually suspended, or she suspended, that's Judge Penny, suspended uh, uh, Jamie Spears as the conservator of that, um, of, of Britney Spears, uh, money for Britney Spears. So so by, by suspending him, uh, that means that he's appointing a CPA, John Zabel, to take it over as the court-appointed conservator for now. Of course, her fans, her lawyers, want her to be out of conservatorship entirely. Her lawyer, Matt Rosengart, today saying he wants 45, uh, 30 to 45 days, not an immediate suspension, because he believes there is further corruption that they can only uncover if Spears is to remain in that position. Again, a little bit of that is cloudy now. What sort of corruption he's talking about, we're not sure. A, a big change since the last time these people were in court, which was in June. A new lawyer and now a new result. Joe? All right. Thanks for the update. Michael Schur live for us tonight. Good to see you. A major announcement today from the NBA. It's going to dock players pay for missed games related to local COVID-19 vaccine mandates. We told you about this last night on the broadcast. The league had previously issued a warning to the New York Knicks, Brooklyn Nets, and Golden State Warriors. The Knicks said last week the team was fully vaccinated. Golden State Warriors guard, though, Andrew Wiggins remains a holdout. And as for the Nets, they haven't shared the team's vaccination status. The vaccine hesitancy in sports isn't just on the court. ESPN, which is owned by Disney, is one of those companies making employees get the shot during an appearance on the Uncut with Jay Cutler podcast. ESPN anchor Sage Steele vented her frustration on the mandate. I respect everyone's decision. I really yeah. do. Yeah. But to mandate it is um, sick. Mm -hmm. And it's scary yeah. to me in many ways. Um, but I have a job, yeah. a job that I love and, frankly, a job that I, that I need. I don't know what comes next, um, but I do know for me personally, I feel, I feel like defeated. We're joined now by Che Huang, CEO of online wholesaler Boxed. Che, it's great to have you. Uh, if we could start right there, I'm curious, are you requiring your employees to get vaccinated? Yeah, so we're lucky enough where our corporate employees, uh, for those that are back in the office, we've asked them to have, have the vaccination or get vaccinated. But for those that are uncomfortable or those that are vaccinated yet uh, have elderly parents at home or immunocompromised family members at home, uh, they could still re work remotely and still be as productive. Uh, but for those that are back in the office, yes, they are absolutely 100% vaccinated now. How many employees do you have, Che? 
So now across the country, we have five to 600 employees. So we've grown quite a bit uh, as we've gone uh, through, the, through uh, when we first started in a garage and now uh, on the cusp of becoming a public company. So I'm wondering how this mandate affects you from the president. If, if I think a company that has more than 100 employees, right, has to mandate that, are you going to, to abide by that? Yeah, well, you know, it, it, you bring up a great point, Joe. You know, uh, the myriad of kind of local, state, federal guidance, advisory, notices, and laws, it's really difficult for business owners to, to really navigate these days. But of course, um, being a company uh, that is law abiding, of course, if it was the law, then we'd have to uh, uh, abide by it. Yeah, okay. Uh, how is it going, by the way? I'm curious, overall, with what's happening, it sounds to me like you still have a lot of employees working from home, others who are there. How, how is it going for you, Jay? Yeah, we're seeing more and more comfort for those uh, that have traditionally worked at home to come back into the office. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, I think we all kind of crave uh, some one-to-one -one connection uh, of actually knowing uh, what your uh, uh, coworkers look like outside of just a screen or mm -hmm. just out, outside of a talking head. And so overall, we're seeing more and more folks come back into the office. But yeah. there are still folks that don't feel comfortable, uh, and that's okay for now for us. Uh, and so those folks are staying home. Shay, tell us a little bit about the supply chain backup. We're seeing the video from these ports. They're crowded. Are you seeing problems? with the supply chain and can people expect delays and possibly even merchandise that isn't going to be there? Yeah, absolutely. You know, after the great kind of toilet paper run of last year, uh, this year, I'm sure everyone's fed up with why can't I find my favorite beverage? Why can't I find my favorite dog food? Uh, you know, these supply chain issues are just hitting the entire uh, economy and the entire world, frankly. And so when you break it down, there's two real components of it. If you're asking, well, why is this really happening? So one is the actual production of the item and the other is the delivery of the actual item. On the production, you know, these firms are, are, are used to squeezing out every penny of profit, and that's really running these machines that produce these items at 99% 99 uh, capacity. And so if there's a surge in demand, you're really not going to be able to create that much more. And then right. now with the labor shortage uh, out there, uh, it's really also difficult to deliver these items throughout the supply chain, as well as the raw materials. So it's really a tale of two cities, but both of which are pointing towards more out of stocks and more supply chain, cha chain challenges uh, for the rest of the year. Is it pointing toward higher prices? Definitely, we're seeing kind of inflation uh, across the board these days, and so labor's a, a big input into that, uh, raw materials. So certainly we're seeing a, a, a really high inflationary environment, uh, but at the same time, we're also seeing a really strong consumer. So uh, um, you're seeing the consumer be able to adapt to some of these higher prices, at least for now, at the current degree. All right. Hey, Che, it is great to have you. Che Wong, the CEO of Boxed. Good luck moving forward, my friend. Thanks for the time. Thanks, Joe. So, you know, the takeaway for most after school specials and drug awareness weeks in school don't do drugs. But now, some new studies show certain drugs might be useful as a treatment, at least if you suffer from depression or PTSD or some others, possibly. Uh, mushrooms, known as uh, magic mushrooms, could be a cure or at least help. And joining me now to talk about this, Texas Representative Alex Dominguez and former Navy SEAL Mark Capone and his wife, executive director of Veterans Exploring Treatment Solutions. They've all worked together to advocate for research into these alternative forms of treatment. Uh, it's great to have all of you. And if I could, Marcus, I want to start with you because I know you've gone through this treatment. I listened to a podcast about this a while ago, but it was fascinating because there is this sort of underlying, I guess, suspicion or concern about what this is all about. Tell us what it was like for you to go through it. Um, well, it wasn't fun. First off, well, first, thanks for watching the podcast. Uh, it, it's not fun at all. I think uh, I think there's been a real uh, stigma around these right. medicines. Uh, they are medicines, right? And uh, I think they were abused in the '60s and '70s, and I think we're getting back to what they're originally intended for. Um, for me, it was just a bit of leap of faith. We had tried everything at the time. Um, I had come back from you know several tours overseas, and I was just struggling with a host of depression, anxiety, and the VA had put me on a ton of different uh, antidepressants and you know, Adderall and Ambien, and it's just, you know, constant, uh, you know, nothing had worked. And uh, this just seemed like a leap of faith that um, it was life-changing. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, 10 to 12 hours of misery, uh, but I came out the other side just whole again and what, ready to enjoy life. What was uh, the misery like, Mark? What was when you were on these these psychedelics? Um, it's It's a journey into your past. Uh, what these psychedelics do is it ha allows you to revisit uh, many of the traumas that potentially can be locked away in your subconscious. And what it does is it brings those forward, excuse me, brings them forward. And so uh, a lot of the issues that you may be dealing with 
um, you actually face those out in, almost like a, in a movie or a dreamlike state. And mm. so uh, just like everything else, when you actually face reality is when you get better. And, and that's what these things did. Representative, let's bring you in because you've worked on a bill. Uh, you guys were, I guess, Marcus, you and your wife were, were both there for the signing of this bill in Texas. So, Representative, let me ask you why you decided to support this. And I guess the bigger question is, how did you sell it? Well, I'll tell you what, it wasn't a, a, as difficult a task as the type of work that Marcus and all the other veterans have done to put their lives at risk to make sure that we maintain our freedoms. So we thought it was important to do something for them. The ah. research that I've been able to find in, in other countries uh, clearly indicates that psychedelic medicine can provide some relief for people who suffer from anxiety and PTSD. We lose 20 veterans every day to suicide. That tells us that the problem is significant. And once we put together this dream team, uh, not just the uh, special operators, but we were mm -hmm. also joined by a number of scientists, including Dr. Lynette Avril, and we got a little boost by former governor and former secretary, Governor Perry. Right. Yeah, Amber, tell me a little bit about, uh, for someone who's concerned about this and thinks, you know, I'm not going to be doing magic mushrooms, what would you say to them having witnessed what happened on the other side? First of all, this is completely out of my comfort zone, but when you're at a point where you are so desperate, you will try anything to save someone you love, you really get creative. And I would say um, to have an open mind about it. And then, you know, the power of these therapies and how effective they are at alleviating suffering. Um, once you know, you know. And we felt a real responsibility to pay this forward to other veteran families who've given so much over the last 20 years. Yeah, Representative, uh, we have 30 seconds left. For, for what you're doing there in Texas, does this allow for research of it or does it dictate how it's actually used? Absolutely. This is a research-based study only. This does not decriminalize the use of psilocybin or psychedelics. We believe that this study will lead the way for other states and possibly the nation to try to study psychedelics and how they can help people with their mental health problems. Right. That's awesome. Hey, listen, it's a fascinating conversation. Marcus and Amber, quickly before we go, can you give us the website so people can learn more about this? Yes, it is vetsolutions.org. All right. It's great to have you. Texas Representative Alex Dominguez, good to see you again. It's been a little while. Also, former Navy yes, CEO sir. Mark Capone and his wife, Executive Director, Veterans Exploring Treatment Solutions. Thanks for the help and the insight tonight. Appreciate it. Good luck to all. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thank you.